Okay, great. Uh, so, my talk will be about the weak value in solid state physics. This is uh, the same topic as the talk by Yuval Geffen in the previous section, so uh, I will be very fast on the introduction and I will give you much more details about um, specific applications we considered. So, uh, you know the collaborators by the talk of Yuval, uh, so it's uh, Yuval himself from the Weizmann Institute, Jaroslav Blanter from Delft University, and Odell Zilberberg with a PhD at Weizmann Institute, and the results I'm going to present are published on the, the, those journals. Um, so, I'll give you my personal introduction to weak values. The paper in which this idea appears first is this paper from 1988, from um, Weidmann, uh, Albert, and uh, Yakir Haranov. And uh, what they claim in this paper is that, uh, as you see from the title, the result of a quantum measurement can be uh, quite a strange result. Indeed, what they do, they consider a, res uh, a measurement, a quantum measurement, between pre- and post-selected ensemble. And what they showed is that if you make a weak measurement, then you have a natural way to associate a, a result, a value to the result of the measurement, and they call this the weak value. So, how does it work? If you think about the typical way of thinking to a quantum measurement is the following one. You have a system in a given state, chi zero, and uh, we will call pre-selection, and we measure uh, an observable, A. This is the result that you obtain if you repeat the experiment many, many times and you average over it according to the rules of quantum mechanics. Now, what the authors of the paper like to do is to, in a way, break this uh, asymmetry in time and ask the question, what happens if you uh, consider not only a measurement with a, uh, which is bounded before it, but also what happens if you put a constraint after the measurement? So the idea is to see what happens to uh, the value of A if you measure it between a pre-selected and a post-selected state. Now the question arises how you make a post-selection, and the idea can be, you know, after you know it, quite simple. You can measure a second observable, let's call it B, and this is a projective measurement, namely it can have different outcomes with certain probabilities, and what you do, you keep the result of the first measurement only if a certain specific outcome arises from the second measurement. Now, let's try to infer with a simple argument, which also Yuval gave, what is the result of this procedure. This is just a mathematical identity. I just multiply it and divide by some quantity. But now let's try to interpret this formula. So if you make a measurement which is weak, you can assume that the state of your system, which is partially correct, is not disturbed after the measurement. So after the measurement, you s your system is still in a state chi zero. Now, if you look at this formula with this interpretation, what you can see is that this part is nothing more than the probability to obtain the final state chi f. And therefore, if you read this equation, it tells you that the, the um, average value of A is obtained as a sum over different outcomes of the probability to obtain this outcome times something else, which you would like naturally to interpret as the conditional average of A, conditional to the outcome of chi f after the second measurement. So this is what they call the weak value. And indeed, if you perform a more rigorous calculation, that's the outcome of your result. You can show that the value of A conditional to the outcome of chi f is indeed the one highlighted in this slide. So this value is um, a bit particular, namely it can give strange results, value which are beyond the spectrum of eigenvalue of A, it can be complex number. So um, I would like to give you a simple picture, try to understand how comes that it can, uh, this can occur. So the system, which is just um, uh, schematic, is the following one. You want to measure an electron which can be in either the left or the right box, and we do it with some detector. It's not important the detail about it. What is important is that this detector gives you a response function, which is a probability to measure, say, a certain current here, and according if the electron is on the left, you will have a certain distribution for the current or the uh, total charge, and if the electron is on the right, you have a different one. Now, if the electron is in super coherent superposition of these two states and you perform the measurement once, you can get either a value which is around I left or a value which is around I right, and at the same time the um, system will collapse according in, uh, in the left or the right uh, uh, box accordingly. But you can have a quite different situation, which is the one in which these distributions are strongly overlapping with each other. In this case, once you do a single measurement, essentially any of the value between I left and I right and also beyond them can appear as a result of your measurement. At 
And at the same time, this means that you acquire very few information about the state of your detector with a single measurement, but at the same time you're not projecting your system, nor to the left, nor to the right. You're weakly disturbing it. This is the case of a weak measurement. Now, what I want simply to show you is that since the distribution is very large, if you perform a post-selection, what you do is um, you modify this distribution and you pick up only part of them. And it can happen that if you properly choose a distribution, you can pick up only the tails of this distribution and the result of your measurement can be larger than the spectrum of the again value of A. So that's just to give you an idea of how it comes that you can obtain strange results from this procedure. But now comes uh, one of the big questions, which is, okay, this is a result of quantum mechanics, which is very nice, but what can you do with it? Um, this is not a complete answer, but it's a partial one. So since uh, this proposal of the weak value, uh, several things happen. First of all, experiments have been carried out, especially in optics, and they have shown the weak value of photon polarization, which is quite recent experiment. Also, it has been shown by Akir uh, himself and others that this uh, idea of weak measurement is quite a powerful tool to investigate um, fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics, like Hardy paradox or counterfactual statements. And very, very recently, a very ap a concrete application of this weak value came uh, to the market, which is uh, the, the fact that weak value is much larger than the typical one can be used in a kind of amplification uh, mechanism in order to create amplifier for very small signals. This has been done also in optics to detect a very small effect, which is called the photon spin hole effect. Now, if you see this list until a few years ago, uh, solid state is completely missing, and um, our idea is to fill a bit this gap. The reason why solid state miss is missing in this list is essentially that uh, in solid state device you have very short decoherence times and in order to realize this weak measurement you need to have your quantum system coherent between the um, weak measurement and uh, the strong one. And also it's, uh, if you typically think to a um, solid state device you have in mind that you can measure charge. And uh, indeed to realize this, uh, this protocol you need two non-commuting observable which corresponds to the weak and the strong measurement. But now, um, due to I mean, recent advances, advances in the field, because especially motivated by quantum computation, the, the field has achieved a certain high degree of control uh, and manipulation of quantum system. And what one can do is take advantage of this manipulation in order to overcome both these, uh, um, these problems. So Yuval showed this in a system, in some detail, a system which concerned the spin of um, two electrons in a double dot. And I will skip completely this part, and I will focus more on the second um, uh, system that Yuval already mentioned. So this is an electronic Maxander interferometer, which is realized in several labs. This is taken, the picture taken from a paper of the group of Moti Heibloom. And uh, let's discuss it. So um, how does it work? Essentially, the optical analog of the Maxander interferometer, which you heard a lot about uh, in this conference, this is the uh, tenth time you heard about it, it works like that. You shade some light in, an in a beam splitter, the light goes through two different paths, and then it's recombined at the end of the um, path. And uh, according to the um, um, phase accumulated by the wave going into two different paths, it can click either in detector 1 or in detector 2, and uh, uh, therefore, if you put, say, a sample in this uh, system, you can use this device to detect uh, phase shift due to any uh, sample in the system. Now, realizing this system in, with electron is uh, a difficult task, but this has been achieved recently. The reason why it's difficult is that in uh, this uh, interferometer, you need the electron not to go multiple times in the, in the loop, but just once. The way this has been overcome is to use edge states of electron in a quantum hole effect, which uh, I'm schematically depicting here. So this is a two-dimensional electron gas with a strong uh, magnetic field, and it's in a quantum hole regime. The electron um, moves, quasi-particles moving in this system are, uh, moves along archiral edge states, and uh, you can engineer the geometry of the system such that you can create more than one edge state, and uh, you can also design the system such that you can have tunneling between the edge states. Essentially what you do, you 
create a, a quantum point contact in specific points, and therefore the edge states can go in both directions. Uh, now you see that this is exactly Max Zender interferometer. That's what happened to an electron, which is injected in S2. It goes because of tunneling through the two path, and it can go either to D2 or to D1, which grounds the electron and take it out of the, of the system. This system has been realized experimentally, and this is uh, one of the, the results shown. So if you look at the vertical line here, what you see is uh, oscillations of the current detected at one of the drain, and these oscillations are, uh, depend on the magnetic field uh, enclosing the orbit of the edge states and are Harnoff-Bohm oscillations. So indeed, this system works, and it works coherently. Now, our aim is to use this system to do um, our weak value protocol. Let me spend one slide to uh, say how, are we, how we describe this system. Uh, what we do is, uh, this is just a scheme of the same uh, device, and uh, the Hamiltonian that we use to describe the system is that of chiral edge states, one, uh, one for each of the edge, and we add two tunneling terms at two different points corresponding to the tunneling of the um, electrons. Uh, in an equivalent way, if you think to the system in, as a single particle, you can describe it in terms of uh, scattering matrices. So you create electron uh, at, uh, in this, uh, at source 1 or source 2, and they are related to propagating electron in the intermediate part of the uh, system via scattering matrices, which relate, uh, which relate the creation and annihilation operator in the first part, the second part, and the third part of the device. How do you do the protocol for measuring the weak value? What you can measure, our proposal is to make a weak measurement of the charge in one of the edge. Then the weak uh, value protocol is quite natural. It happens like that. You inject electron only from one of the source, let's say source one. Then because of the scattering uh, matrix, it's splitted into two, or because of tunneling between the edge, it's splitted in the coherent superposition of electron going around in the two arms. and if you have a weakly coupled charge detector, this is just a picture to say the distribution is, uh, would, if you measure many times, you have a wide distribution, meaning it's a, a weak detector. You detect the charge in this uh, part of the sample. And then what you do, you keep your result only if your electron clicks at detector D equal D2. The result of this procedure is a weak value, according to um, the paper by Yakir and others, and this is the expression that we learned about it. So what we can do is just plug in, in this expression the, um, uh, the proper uh, formula for the pre-selection, the weakly measured operator and post-selection, and obtain the results. But actually you can do it in two ways. You can think, as I said before, to this problem as a single particle problem, in which case you know very easily what are the pre-selection, the weakly measured operator, and the post-selection one, which are written in terms of creation uh, operators, or you can do it a many-body way, in which you have uh, the, um, the average, you, now you have to read this part of the formula. The average is performed of the out-of-equilibrium steady state of the system, consisting in applying a certain voltage bias to the system. The, the operator that you have to measure is the charge operator, which is written in terms of the field uh, uh, of the edge states, and what, you, what is your post-selection is just detecting a current, which is indeed a projection operator at the source D2. If you use these two recipes, you end up with these results, and these results are generally speaking different. They are not identical to each other. So a natural question arises is uh, which of the two is the right one, and what are the differences between a single particle approach and a many-body one? That's the question that we asked, and in order to answer uh, the question, we thought about a real experiment in which we have a real detector that measures the charge, and this detector is another Max Zender interferometer. So the protocol works like that. Uh, you have, okay, let me say why this can be a detector for the charge. The interference in this system, if you measure the charge here at D4, depends on the interference uh, across this um, area. And if you have an electrostatic interaction of the electron of the edge states going along this line with another charged particle here, the interference will change, and therefore the resulting value of the, um, of the current will be changed. So this is a good detector to measure the charge along this uh, arm, and what you measure is indeed the current over a time integral of the current over a certain period, or eventually its average. Now what you have to do is you keep the result of your measurement only if you have uh, a click of the edge state at detector D2, and what we can do is to compute this formula. 
And what we show is that the current at d, d4 is indeed the current, okay, we calculated this formula perturbatively in the coupling between the two, um, the detector and the system, and what you get is the first order, which is the steady state current uh, if there is no charge, plus a correction. This first order correction can be written in the following form. It's a product of two objects, each belonging to, one belonging to the system and one belonging to the detector, and these two objects are indeed the many body weak value, both the system and the detector. So what is remarkable about that? First of all, you know that what you measure in experiment is a many body weak value. The second thing is that this result is interesting because if you, if you, okay, so this is the part of the system and this is the detector uh, part. If you forget that this is a weak value and you think about the detector part just as a tunable um, object of the detector, which is tunable because you can control the magnetic field, what you can do is by controlling the magnetic flux through this uh, loop, you can access both the imaginary part and the real part of the system. Let me say, if you control the phase here, the flux here, such that this object is real, what you are measuring is the imaginary part of the weak value. If you do uh, the other way around, and this is uh, uh, an imaginary object, what you are measuring here is the uh, real part of it. Uh, okay, I'm, I want to skip the details of the formula, and let's go to the many-body weak value. And let's compare the many-body weak value with a single particle one. So what is the main difference between the two? Uh, apart from some temperature effect, let's discuss it at zero temperature, what you can show is that the many-body weak value is indeed the single particle one plus an extra term. And this extra term is shock noise-like behavior. Namely, what happens is that your post-selection is able to post-select only one of the excitation, while all the other uh, um, excitation in the system, this n is an approximation which depends on the voltage and time of the duration of the measurement, are proportional to the usual average value of the, of the system. Okay, I'm finishing. So I just want to show the pictures with um, uh, the results that show that uh, what I want to enlighten here is that this shadow region show that also if you have finite temperature or finite voltage bias, you still can have uh, part of the area of parameters where you get weak value which are beyond the standard value, both if you have high temperature and if you have finite voltage bias. Okay, so what I showed you in this uh, talk is just that um, uh, we showed how to realize weak values in solid state devices. And uh, in particular, with this um, electronic Maxander interferometer, we have been both able to achieve a tomography of the weak value. We can measure the real and imaginary part. And we showed that uh, uh, it is the many body weak value, and uh, that is affected by shock noise like terms, which uh, destroy the effect. So, the other works are in progress. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, okay, so the weak values are, I mean, both the cases that we consider are related to cross correlation between currents, yes. But the way to carry out the experiment is different. I mean, here you have to, making a post selection is a different procedure, but what turns out, if you look at the equation, that indeed you. They are related to cross correlation between currents, yes. If you had, instead of choosing detector D2, chosen detector D1, what would have happened? The weak value would have been different? Or? Uh, yes. And How did you decide which is the one that is physical? Because different, the different, okay, the weak value depends, they're both physical. Weak value depends on the pre selected state and post selected state. Right. By changing the, the detection, what you are changing is the post selection. Therefore, you get different weak values. So it depends if you want your value conditional to some outcomes. It depends on which outcomes you choose, you get different result, which is uh, and if you the case. The two, you would... If you average them with the corresponding probability to obtain them, you get the standard quantum mechanical average. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Let's start the speaker again.